You're listening to 94.4 FM, South of City Radio, the Friday Sports with your host, Jimmy Matruzzi. We bring you all the news from the local area and around the world. We're very fortunate to show to have some world-class athletes, sports people, people in sport across a range of different disciplines, coaches, sports psychologists. We've interviewed people in the world of football. We also have a segment speaking to some of the leading psychologists and related fields, people in the field of psychology and related fields who give us insight into their research and ideas in, in, in mental health as well. Today we have a fascinating guest who's going to give us an insight into the, the world of non-league. Um, he's been on the show before and I've had the privilege of working closely with our, our next guest and uh, I, I, I can assure you you're in for a, a really interesting insight into the world of football uh, in non-league and, and, and all things um, non-league. So we've got Brent Peters, the manager of Bake Up Borough Football Club. Brent, welcome to the show. Great to have you on board. Yeah, good to be on board, uh, Jimmy. How are you? Yeah, no, good, Brent. I mean, it's been a challenging uh, season, no doubt, for, for, for every club, you know, at every level, and but non-league. Um, and we'll sort of get to that. It'd be great to see your insight in terms of what it's like um, to, to run a club um, in, in the situation we're in at the moment. Um, which is no doubt challenging. But we start with the team, Baker, Brent. It's a, it's a young team. It's been developing nicely over, over the last year or two. And this season, the sort of fruits of the labour are coming through. The, the lads have been putting some great performances in. Tell us where they are at the moment in terms of um, team-wise. Where, where do you sort of rate this team, Brent, compared to possible... Well, it's hard to compare to different team, Baker, up teams. But where do you sort of put this, this crop of young players? Well... As you know, Jimmy, I've been in the game at varying levels uh, for uh, over 40 years. And uh, I've got on record as saying that this this, this team, uh, collectively, this young side at, uh, at Bake Up Borough, it's probably from a, a togetherness point of view and, you know, comradeship. And, you know, it's probably been one of, the, if, if not the best, changing room I've been uh, I've been involved in you know it's um, it's truly remarkable that you know the, the way that they're all uh, all together you know the, the close bonding and I think a lot of that is is that they're all of a similar age there's no mm. there's no ma- there's no big characters in the changing room you know I think in the past where you've got usually you've got one or two of the younger lads in and then you've got some senior players in you know that's been around non-league football league um, you know that's like up at the late late 20s into 30s sometimes the younger lads are, are in the shell mm. um, but th- because this is a group of all of a similar age group they share the same passion uh, you know this you know when they're talking about dress when they're talking about music everything about them is you know when you can go out obviously we're in the middle of a pandemic and you know that's very difficult mm. but everything about them is all the, the, the you know they have the all the, the same um they believe everything and everything and they, and they go out there on the pitch and on the pitch everybody's you know fighting for each other mm. and like i said it's it's probably one of the best uh uh, changing rooms I've been involved with in, in, in my time in, uh, in football. They're a great bunch of lads. They mm. want to learn, they listen, um, and it's uh, uh, you know it's a pleasure to be to you know to be amongst them. Mm, absolutely, and it's interesting you say, Brent, because in in pre-season, some of the pre-season friendlies, um, they sort of started. I know pre-season friendlies are they are what they are, but they are still a benchmark and. I think they started to catch the attention of a few people. The the, the game was against Ramsbottom, and, and and the team that South had sent across to was just, you know a reasonably strong team as well, by the way. And the, you know the lads put in some good performances, and and they sort of carried that form into the league too, uh, as well. I suppose the challenge is, as you mentioned, the pandemic, and and, and Bake Up certainly has put um, you know health and safety a priority, and and all all the, all the right things. That's for sure in terms of prioritising health and safety, but. It is what it is, and, and obviously the momentum's been, you know, with the season stopping and starting. And what were your thoughts, Brent, sort of looking at the team throughout the friendlies and carrying that form into the league? Yeah, I, I, I was impressed. Uh, I mean, you, you know, um, right at the beginning of pre-season, 
we got into we, we decided on a looking at, at the group and uh, we decided on a on a shape that we wanted to play and it's like in any shape that you, everybody has roles and responsibilities and we work with them on the shape and we work with them in the res- roles and responsibilities um, but one thing that, that really struck a chord with me was was like we've got a sports bar show mm. and um, we had a guest on the sports bar show and one of the comments that, that our guest he was he, he was he'd been in, involved with uh, the England well he was actually the the last England coach head, head coach uh, to win a, a, a major tr- uh, tournament um, which was the the World Cup I think it was it with the under twenty. England under twenty threes, I think it were, uh, mm. when they won the World Cup two seasons ago, and um, our guest that was on there, he he he, he turned round and, and came out with a classic that he said that what we did and to win that tournament, he said we gave uh, we gave them owner, ownership. He said we give the players mm. ownership, so we let them like sort of we we guided them, and then he said and then well, what we did, he said we gave them ownership of of, of running it, so mm. running their own their own changing room basically, and that's something that me and Dave Felgate um, decided to do with our lads, and up to now, sure it's worked a treat because. You know, we've given them the ownership to, to take the lead. They know that, that how we want to play. They know everybody's roles and responsibilities. And it's not a case mm-hmm. now of where it used, where it was in the past. You know, where where we come in the changing room and we've got to like, you know, sort to like rep, uh, put right what's what's wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, they can do that on their own because they know exactly what's, what what <laughs> to put right what's wrong because they know exactly everybody's role and what they should be doing. Mm. So, if say for instance, say for instance, somebody's recovery run, you know they're being lazy and they're, they're they're not getting back in when they should be getting back in. You know they can deal with it. We we don't have to deal with that because they know that that you know if your left full back, your right full back hasn't got back in, then they will deal with that situation because rather than in the past by not giving them ownership um, mm. we have to deal with that and then it's kind of it kind of again gets it to, it's the players against the manager and the players against the coach but mm. we, well, we don't have that situation here because they know what what we want mm, mm. every one of them knows exactly what the manager and the coaches want and they know the roles and responsibility within that team shape and they take ownership and that has been a, a major factor in the way that I think that we started uh, mm. the campaign yeah and, and the results was you know uh, fantastic and it was that, so that the winning run and uh, in, in one sense you know the game is about momentum and um, but equally in saying that it's been been mentioned earlier, challenging year and the pandemics had a big impact. Um, on, you know, in, in terms of in terms of for, for football teams and sporting teams and and, and life in general. Uh, in one sense, how do you sort of pick the team up again, Brent? You know, they go on a winning run and then obviously at some point, uh, all things being well, that start playing again. And how do you sort of pick up from from where you left off? Is that a challenge on the field as well? Well, obviously we started the season, uh, when the season kicked off, uh, the season it kicked off, let me get this right, we're in October, beginning of October, I think we played our first Vars game uh, in a preliminary round uh, towards the end of September, I think the last week in September, and then the league season campaign started in October. Now the crazy thing is, in the, in October, you know, most teams have only played in the league program. I think if you look at a league table, I think the most anybody's played is, is seven matches mm-hmm. before it went into another lockdown. I mean, we've played five matches uh, up to up to Sunday. We played five matches, of which three were played in the league, and we'd won all three of them. And two had been played in the FA Vars, mm-hmm. and uh, and we'd won both the FA Vars games. So. Uh, you know, and then obviously what happened then were at the end of uh, at the end of October we end up hitting another another lockdown scenario. Mm. Uh, 
which is which has been very very because when you're building that head of steam up and you've got that mm-hmm. momentum and you're running unbeaten runs in 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 the competitions that you're playing in, you want to carry on, you want to keep going. So the difficult part is with the restrictions that. Um, the most important uh, scenario for, uh, from our point of view was because we had an important Vaz game when we were kind of, you know, at some point we would have to go into that FA Vaz game. The most mm. important thing is, is making sure that the lads were ticking over. Mm. And we give ownership, again, it was all about ownership. We went through our captain, Michael Gervin, and he, he took ownership with the group, with the lads. Um, all filtered back to us through Sparta. Everything we filtered, we, we, we worked programs out for them, and they were all doing. We saw they were still out there doing a training program, but individually. But we could still monitor them, mm-hmm. uh, and that was run and and uh, and controlled with us overseeing it by the captain. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that, that kind of worked well. The lads were tremendous on that. You know, I mean, everybody. Mm-hmm bought into it and uh, you know and, uh, and you gave them an extra impetus and an extra challenge mm. to challenge each other absolutely and and you know it, it, and sort of there's an impact like you mentioned there you know off the field the momentum they build momentum up and in in in, a, in an ideal world all things being well that that you know form they keep that form going and you know they're, they're looking pretty much uh unbeatable at one point you know in in, in top form Obviously, you know the the, the season stops for, for good reason. Health and safety is the priority. But we look at off the field. I mean, I know you can only speak for for Bake Up, and obviously different non-league clubs will have different situations. But what's it like in terms of non-league from from a running the club point of view? Because the, the club obviously, you know, when all things being well, run social events and and many other things. And what's it like to to, to run the club and keep things going, Brent, in these sort of difficult times? Yeah, it's an absolute nightmare because uh, it's all about uh, it's all about controlling the costs. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, it's it's all about controlling the, the spending. You know, we, and this is one of the reasons why I said that what happened last year. Uh, if you go back, people have short memories. When when look, you, you know, everybody has their opinions about should football have come back and mm. one thing or another they all have opinions and all that, obviously that, that's what makes the world go around we all have different opinions but when the season last season came to abrupt end in March and all the science was saying that uh, you know there'll be an, you know there'll be another wave and it, we, it didn't need anybody with half a brain to, to realise that, uh, you know, come to the winter months, the chances are other spikes were going to, you know, going to appear. Mm. And we, there were no cure, and we're well and truly in the middle of a pandemic. So mm. m- my philosophy, looking at, looking at the whole situation, I'm not talking about, le- uh, you know, the football league side of things now. I'm talking about... When I when I answer this question, I'm talking more about you know non-league uh, mm-hmm. where it's not the primary employment, yeah. right? So in in my opinion, because football is not it's not people's primary employment, mm. I firmly believe that the leagues, uh, the FA, I I think the FA have been totally irresponsible in respect of r- rushing to try and get seasons back started mm-hmm. when we're in the middle of a pandemic that is my opinion i said in march that uh, i didn't think season and nobody should have been thinking about starting another season until at least at the earliest january and mm-hmm. the reason why i said that is because i was listening to all all the science that was coming out and it was obvious that when the the, the, the winter months set in that there'd be there'd be further disruptions there'd be further spikes mm-hmm. it, uh, which has proved exactly right. Um, so, coming out of Christmas and and, and and into January and February, I felt that we we might see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Now, the, by the fact that the the FA have decided to rush things to try and set up a season to start a season, mm. and even then. We, we'd even said that clubs like us didn't want to, couldn't afford to play with no fans. Mm, you know, mm. we can't. You know, there's, there's too much cost involved to stage a football match, so to not be able to recoup any money, you know, is just a recipe for a disaster. Mm. So, 
whether people believe what I'm saying or not, but I'll tell you now, once the football season started, that was when all the costs start. Mm -hmm. Once the football season was on hold, there aren't the same costs. Yeah, they've still got a little bit of cost because you've, you know, your grounds have still got to be maintained. Mm. <laughs> Excuse me. Your grounds have got to be maintained. You still got your your electric, gas, water, all that sort of things. You, you, your service is still to pay, mm. but you haven't got the more uh, stringent costs like you, you know the player insurances and uh, you know like mm. you, you know, when when games start, you've got referees that uh, you know produce yellow red cards, and you know what yellow red cards means. You know even though a player gets a yellow card and a red card. It, it's all money. Mm -hmm. You know, so the fines at the end of it. And then the accumulation of bookings and red cards leads to the club getting fined as well because these these bookings they, they collate points towards the clubs. Mm -hmm. So every, so when you collate so many points, then you get to a certain uh, a, a, a collection of points, then you, the FA come down on you and fine your club because uh, you know you've had so many points on your on your discipline record, and, you, and then it goes to a stage two, and if you hit stage two with with too many uh, in disciplines your fine kind of doubles again so you've got a, a bigger fine and that's the way it goes so and then and then on top of that because the football season started you've also got situations whereby you know if you've got contract players you've got to pay them mm -hmm. if, you've, if you've got non-contract players you know they're on expenses so you've got mm -hmm. to give them money to travel wherever you're traveling to and from games in addition to that, you've got all the expense of the match officials and everything else and everything that goes with staging a football match. So from my point of view, whilst there was no football, I always felt comfortable that, uh, you know, we get we get through it and come out at the other end and, you know, it, it would be a struggle, but we will get there. Once, once the football season um, sort of got the green light, from... Baker, but personally, I wanted that football season to just carry on, mm -hmm. just go with plain sailing, so you go through it. What we didn't want is disruption, because as soon as you get disruption, which we've had, don't forget, mm -hmm. they bring the football season back, starts in, in October, and by the end of October, beginning of November, it goes on lockdown again. Mm -hmm. So everybody's only played, you know, like I said, a maximum, we've only played three league games, but some clubs have played seven, but seven's the cut-off. So seven. So you've come. You've come to November, and you've got seven league games in. But in my opinion, why did they bring the football season back? Mm -hmm. You know, that's just my opinion. Yeah, you know, no, because they waited and reviewed it, and probably reviewed it in January with a view to starting in January, February, or even you know, even play even for one season. You know, playing like the Irish play, the play that play like Southern Ireland play. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely, they, they, yeah. They, in, in February, March, March, I think it is when they when they start. Yeah. So there's, you know, things have to change because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see any sense in a football in a football season starting, right? What we're going to have disruptions, and I can still well, hopefully there's a light at the end of the tunnel now with the injections and one thing and another. But what we don't want is what happened last year when it comes to March, they had to finish the season uh, prematurely so they finish the season uh, prematurely and when they finish the season prematurely mm. um, uh, um, everything were nil and void yes yeah I mean that's, that's, that's you know that's, that's the last thing absolutely that, that, that's in interesting you say Ren, you've made some really 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 important issues and I think that they certainly need to be taken in consideration. I think that one thing that you know certainly I, I you know I'm concerned about, and, and you might be able to, you'll, you'll certainly be able to answer the question better than me, and and maybe shed some more light on the on the area, is is the sort of state of the game in in, in non-league. I mean, we've seen sort of financial packages for for different leagues, and you know I don't know the full implications of those, but in terms of financially, um, we know how much non-league means to people. I've said before, it's the lifeblood. It's really important um, in this country. We love our sport, and non-league football is is certainly a pillar for many communities to sort of go. It's not just a game; it's a social event, and the clubhouse, and food, and 
interaction and it's, it's a massive social thing for a lot of people is it sustainable Brent I mean what's going to happen to non-league do you think if this sort of carries on and and what is there any so is there any solutions are there any possibilities to sort of to look at um you know financial package from maybe the the, the, the premier league or, or the government or the fa or all all, all free really what what's the future do you think Brent, of non-league if this carries on well there's there's, there's obviously muted at the minute there's a support package supposed to be coming through from Sport England, which is uh, I don't know where that money's coming through, filtered down from the Premier League, and it's it's, it's obviously being filtered down. And I think the talk, uh, you know, at our level three, to, I think it's from level three to six. I think there's talk about fourteen million um, yeah. being filtered down, but fourteen million isn't in the in the true scheme of things isn't that great amount of money and equally they're talking about uh, it being a loan rather than a grant mm -hmm. which it's all a little bit up in the air at the minute but uh, you know it, we can't clubs at our level we don't want to be taking loans out where they've got to repay it it's got to be it's got to be grant it's got to be grant money mm -hmm. uh, but it's like it's like you know all clubs are like us at the, at the minute. You know, at the end of the day, it's a situation which is tough. Uh, we're in a tier three. We can't have fans in. So when you can't have fans in, you know, there's no re real way. You, you know, staging a football match is is very very difficult with no fans. But equally, on top of having no fans in, you know, you've no bar. Mm. Your facilities, you've no hospitality, you've no nothing. We're on, you know, for most of the since March, from majority of the time, apart from probably just a, uh, an isolated few week. In all honesty, at this football club, we've uh, we've been like on hundred percent lockdown, hundred percent. By hundred percent, what I mean is, there's no football, so there's no fans can come in, right? Because there's no football at all. But your bar is shut, so there's no hospitality. Mm. Uh, you know and so that's all your source of income mm. so you've got no source of income you know, it's, yeah. it's the way it is it's just, it's just tough it's just real I mean we're in a better and fortunate more unfortunate position than some clubs when we get playing again because we have got you know our facility has got is a function facility so you mm. can start to have functions when when that starts up again mm. where a clubs in our league they, they, well they might have a bar but they don't kind of have um, they, can't, they, they don't kind of have a function facility mm -hmm. but, Absolutely. Have that. Yeah. but the, the simple fact is at this moment in time and for several months there's been no there's not been no socialising there's been mm. no f functions there's been nothing mm. you know we're absolutely you know you see, the, I can't stress it enough, but we're not on, we're not isolated. Mm. Other clubs then we're on theoretically hundred percent lockdown. Mm. Absolutely, and now that's, that's you made some really interesting points there, Brenton. And, and and I suppose you know absolutely you know health and safety is, is a priority. You completely understand that, and 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 obviously Baker has you know been at the forefront. Have done everything um, from a guideline point of view. The point being is that okay, so no fans of the club, no 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 social function, and that's where I think for me there's got to be um, in, perhaps some sort of financial package that helps the clubs tick over and get through these, the you know to, to maybe compensate for them not being fans or or not be able to do sort of social uh, events, at least some sort of base to keep the clubs ticking over because it would be a disaster, Brent, if non-league football um, wasn't able to sustain itself it would be a complete disaster albeit one could argue it's not essential um, but it does form a massive part of the community in terms of your own force Brent you've been in the game at various levels and you've been in non-league you, you sort of I think in one sense you could you could make a point you are a voice for the league you've, I think you know they people should consult you you've been in the game for a long time you understand the game I mean realistically Brent um, going forward uh, what, what would be um, you know what would, what would you like to sort of see uh, happen um, you know from a realistic point of view to sort of help the non-league clubs um, be able to sustain themselves and then like you said get the season going maybe um, at a different time of year 
what are some of the things that any policymaker listening um, could take into consideration? Um, well, so moving forward, I, I've always listen. I, I, I'm not employed uh, to, to to think out solutions of uh, mm. what I'm going to say now. But for, you know, in in reality, I think there's got to be for non-league clubs, and certainly at non-league clubs that uh, outside probably. Uh, probably from from step three down to step seven, what I'm talking about now, mm. I I kind of think that what would be a good thing, and you know, this won't go down well uh, well with a lot of people. I'll tell you that now because uh, people don't like change. Mm. When you look at, at, at uh, what everything's stacked up against non-league football at, uh, you know, certainly down at our level, everything's against it. it when you look at it, it used to be, let's let's backtrack several years ago, right? All teams throughout the country kicked off at, on a Saturday at three o'clock, mm. right? There was no, um, there were no Sky TV live matches, all that carry on back in the day, right? The motorway networks were nothing like they are today. Mm -hmm. So my point is, when non-league was thriving, you know, I used to get, like I can look at Baker Borough, the old pictures at Baker Borough, used to have lots of fans on this ground, mm -hmm. right? Because, uh, like you say, true community football club. All of a sudden, times change. And when times and, and and the times when the times change is by the network, the road network opens up, the motorway networks open up. You mm -hmm. can access Manchester, you know, in super quick time from Bake Up, right? Mm -hmm. You can even access so for instance you can accept all over East Lancashire, you could be at Blackburn in no time, you know, like so if you wanted to go and watch them Blackburn Rovers a few years ago were in the premiership. Mm -hmm. So consequently, when Blackburn Rovers were in the premiership, if you were like kinda wanted to watch uh Chelsea or Arsenal or any of the London clubs, right, it wasn't really possible to go and see them the same. But like when Blackburn Rovers were in the premiership, right, you could go to Blackburn, it'd be easy access to Blackburn, you could go and watch a London team, Tottenham, playing at Blackburn Rovers for not a lot of money. Mm. And you could easily network it and get there, you know, with the, with the road systems and everything else. So when that happened, right, that were taking people away from the grassroots game because, you know, it's, it's, it, was, it, it wasn't expensive to go and watch those clubs mm -hmm. and were easier accessible. Now then, since then, times have moved on again since, whereas Sky Television, there's football on all the time, nearly every night in the week, there's, mm -hmm. there's live games on. So, we're playing a winter sport. Now, it's always been a winter sport, but take, you know, I'm talking, we're one of the third highest grounds in the, in the country. Mm. So, if it's a cold, horrible, wet, miserable night in Bake Up, mm. Bake Up Borough playing, you know, let's say, for instance, Bake Up Borough playing a local derby and they're playing Nelson mm. at, at Bake Up, right? But the same night, Alive on Sky TV is Manchester United in the Champions League playing Real Madrid and they can sit in front of the fire mm. and watch yeah. that game. Are they going to come out of their house to go and stand on Westview in the Brian Boys Westview Stadium, right? Although it's only six pounds to come on, mm. you know, in a wet, damp, horrible, cold, freezing Bake Up Borough on top of a hill, mm. which you could lose. You know, so my point being, yeah. um, we're in a situation as well where we don't get, you know, clubs at our level don't get any, you know, TV don't come round and, and and televise your game, so you can't get any television money. So it's all about to sustain, keep the non-league teams uh, in business, 
there's got to be a bit of a change in my opinion mm. and I think that changes if they change the seasons and you started and commenced the football season again I'm going to tell you that I'm not employed I'm not employed by the FA and how they would how they would impl- implement this in promotion and relegation as you get higher up the pyramid mm. but what in principle, what I'm trying to say is, if we kick seasons off in February, March, like they do in Southern Ireland, mm-hmm. if you kick seasons off then, you then come into the better weather, mm-hmm. you come into the end of the back end of the national football season, you know, where, you know, like your premiership teams and anything. So the chances are your gates are going to improve because these teams, we, we've seen it even in lockdown because Burnley can't get spectators in. You know, we, our gates have, 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 have more like doubled mm. follow me because yeah. the, we'll come and get the football fix so once the, the, the Premier League season's finished absolutely then supporters will go and get the football fix they'll jump on Bake Up Borough right equally mm. if it's a if the weather is, 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 is better you know you're coming into the spring and summer months absolutely yeah like the nights so a light tonight saves your costs on your floodlights. It saves your, you know, uh, so you don't have to have your floodlights on. Mm. Equally, it's more enjoyable. So couples will be going for a walk. You know, we'll get out of the house, we'll go for a walk. Oh, I'll tell you what, Bake Up Borough's playing Absolutely, tonight. Absolutely, yeah. Go and watch Bake Up Borough. You know, so they'll stand on Bake Up for an hour and a half, two hours on Bake Up on a, on a lovely uh, summer evening, mm. you know, and then enjoy the football. And that will get us more people in, and it will mm. obviously keep our cost down. But that means there's got to be a big change in in changing the format of football with the seasons. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, but something's going to happen. But I think that if that was to happen and they thought it out how they could do it, the issue is I thought it out many a time, and there is a bit of a problem because when you get to the uh, higher up the pyramid and you're on promotion, you mm. might have to wait several months before you before you can you, because obviously you've got to pick the the conference national up then, haven't you? Of course, and yeah. It's, it's, it, but that's not for, listen. That's for the powers to be. That's yeah. why they get so much money. Absolutely, you know, yeah. they, they're thinking these things out. But you ask me a question here. Yeah. About what, what would help non-league clubs? Well, I tell you now, I honestly believe, firmly believe, given that there's, there's, there's live TV football on live TV nearly most nights in the week, mm. given that we're always fighting with the weather and the seasons, since climates, uh, uh, everything's changed mm. with, the, with the weather, you know, and the seasons are, it seems to all have changed. So, so basically, you know, we're always fighting against the weather in winter. So you get games called off. Um, dark nights, you have to have floodlights on. It's not always, you know, people don't want to come out on a cold, wet, horrible night when they can see a live television and, and sit in front of their own homes. Mm. So by moving the, the seasons round and the months round and getting more better climate, playing in a better climate, mm-hmm. I think that will attract more fans, so that gets more money into your club. It will also safeguard, you know, you won't have to use the floodlights the same. And obviously, you know, maybe your, your pitches aren't getting the same uh, damage mm-hmm. because you're not playing in a, in a more wet, horrible winter's climate. Mm, absolutely, but that's, that's really interesting stuff. And, and certainly um, there are some of the, the Scandinavian leagues as well, I believe, that play, um, you know, February uh, to, to and, and, you know, to... to uh, October, September, October anyway, but I think obviously, you know, like you've mentioned there, it's, it's down to the powers that be, but in one sense, you know, it could be that that materialises um, down to the, due to the, the pandemic, it's sort of things change and at the point of doing the show, it's a pre-recording, but obviously, you know, going forward, things things could change and it could be, Brent, that that's the case um, next year um, through just basically the, the, the situation with, with the pandemic and and, and, and I suppose if that were to be the case and, and things did sort of start again, you know, February, March, and things worked out really well, then that could be something for them to certainly um, take into consideration, um, you know, uh, moving forward. So if something, is, you know, okay has come out of this situation uh, we're in, then, then that could be the, uh, uh, the case going forward. And that's a you know, really interesting point. And in terms of yourself, Brent, sort of, you know, where do you sort of see, uh, what's your sort of vision now um, for the club? I mean, you've done some great work on and off the field, 
um, you've worked tirelessly off the field, on the field to sort of to provide the, the, the players with a great opportunity to sort of get out there and play uh, on, on, a, on a good pitch and there's been a lot of work being done around the club as well too. I mean, you know, going forward, all things being well and, and, and hopefully things, in, you know, obviously being able to sort of pick up playing again. Um, what what do you see the next chapters being for, for Baker, Brent? Well, listen, I said when I came in here 23 years ago, I said there's no reason why with the people I know in the game and my contacts and my knowledge and everything else that this club you know, in ten years, couldn't have been uh, couldn't have been knocking on the door of the of the national conference. Mm. What I didn't re- realise when I made that statement at the time, just um, I, I said it from a, an honest football manager. Don't forget, I came here from Doncaster Rovers, mm. and I've been previous at that at Bury Football Club. Uh, so I come from a football league kind of background, if you will, and I said it from a, an honest football perspective. Um, but like you know at Baker Borough, I oversee and run all the aspects of the club on the business side and everything. And what I didn't realise when I said that, the amount of uh, skeletons that jumped out the cupboard at me on off the pitch and, uh, you know, the infighting they had with the council to secure, to make sure the club got a better and more secure uh, lease that was fit for purpose and things like that. And, it, you know, these things take time and they don't happen over overnight. So... You know, you're asking a question of where where we want to be. I mean, in an ideal world, mm. you know, we want to be pushing up up, up the league and, and getting promotion and getting higher up the, up the national uh, up the national pyramid. Mm. But that takes money in finances. I mean, it's all about money. And unfortunately, whether we like it or we don't like it, if you haven't got the money and the finances, you can't do it. But you know full well that if you have got the finances and the infrastructure are about you, you can you could soon progress mm. like proved it with with the likes of Fleetwood, who, who we go out and lock arms with. It's proved it with the likes of Salford, mm-hmm. who lock arms with, and it's proved it with the likes of Accrington Stanley, who we used to lock arms with. So mm. I think the answer to your question is. It's what I need around me, or is another class of ninety two. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and, and, and then get up then that pyramid. Yeah, not for sure. And, and the, our listeners sort of, some of us are sort of thinking, okay, um, you know, where Bake-Up is, 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 you know, obviously the point you've made there is it possible. You've made a great point there, Brent, that we've seen with Salford, you know, classes 92 has got behind them and, and, and how, you know, quickly um, they've managed to sort of rise into the league, albeit at the moment. Uh, I think that's, you know, challenges that getting into the league and, and, and you know, perhaps, you know, they, they've probably finding it a little bit more difficult in, in league football than, than not so much the class of 92 thought they would, but just generally speaking, it's, it's, it's a tough league. Professional football is not easy, um, but, you know, it, it's one of them. It sort of, it goes to show. And see, I'm, Speaking of, I mean, I, I'm just sort of seeing, I can't remember which website it was on. And, I mean, when you think about Salford, how quick, did it, I, I know you can only speak for, for Baker in that respect, but did, did it surprise you, Brent, that they moved up so fast? I mean, in terms of they've got the backing and, once you've got the backing, and I don't, I don't think no, I don't, I don't. It doesn't surprise me mm. at all because it's all. Listen, one of the biggest setbacks here, from me, from my point of view, and I'm, I'm talking from the level we're at now at Bay Cup, right? And over over years, we've been a club. Now, if you haven't got, when I say money, right? In an ideal world, you know, you've been in football yourself a long time, right? Mm. Now, to get promotion. Uh, and be involved at the business end of the season on a nine-month football season. You've got to be having. You've got to. You've got to have with you an healthy, quality squad. Mm-hmm. Now, we've always had a good squad of players, probably for the first eleven. The second eleven. What I'm saying is the second eleven has not had the same amount of quality and it's not had the same experience because we haven't got the money to carry them people because what you find is if you build a squad of players and, and let's say they're, you know, they're non-contract players and you build a good squad of players and you want, you, you know, like what we firmly believe here that you fight for your shirt, you know, competition's healthy and you, 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 want, you want healthy competition that people get the shirt, they're trying hard to keep it, other people are breathing down the neck, right? If they're 
non-contract, what you find is, and the good quality, and you've got a good quality squad, what you find is, when you, because other teams out there see that, you know, certain players aren't getting in your team who are quality because they can't get in because you've got a quality starting 11, mm. right? They put the seven-day notice in and because they're offering them regular football and they're not having to challenge for a, for a place and more or less guaranteeing them a place, they move ship, they jump ship. Mm. So, so consequently, if you get a few knocks in your first 11, then you ain't got the same quality to fall back on to, mm. put, them in, to put them in that team. You ain't got the same quality and that's when you, you kind of results start going a bit pear-shaped. I mean, take last season, for instance, where, you know, I've built a team here uh, at the beginning of the season, close season, built a team, no problem, absolutely good, some good young lads with some good quality senior players. And I pushed the boat out for my, my striker, the one who were going to score the goals. I kind of pushed him and pushed him and pushed him to go on contract. He's been on contract to this football club before, but you know, he, 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 you know, but he, he's obviously got gone on to be older. You know, he's coming to the like, back end of his football career, if you know what I'm trying to get at. Mm. You know, he's or up to thirty. Um, but I, I still knew that I knew that if he were playing here on a non-contract basis and banging the goals in, where I knew he would bang the goals in, mm. I knew it wouldn't be long before the clubs two leagues above, three leagues above, will be coming in for him on a seven day, it's a stamp seven day notice, you know what I mean? It's not mm -hmm. even a stamp email. So they'd be, a, they'd be a, trying to offer him more money to go and play for their team and take him away. Now on a seven day notice, so you work hard all pre-season, you get your squad together, you start the season, you're flying, the lad won't sign a contract because he feels he doesn't want, but he gives you like a gentleman's agreement and says, I won't be leaving, don't worry about that. But then somebody, you know as well as I know, mm. not cheap, somebody comes in and, and puts that seven-day notice in and their head gets turned because they get offered a king's ransom to go and play somewhere else. They know no loyalties, they go. Mm. But when you lose that striker, because you haven't got the strength in depth, all of a sudden, from, hitting a, from scoring four, five, six goals a game, down three goals, four goals, five goals, six goals, you then get into the situation, you get into the final third and you can't hit a bind door. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you, you, instead of winning games comfortably, you start ending up in a situation where you're not winning games comfortably, you, you know, you're, you're on a knife edge and you're ending up losing games one and two nil because you can't, you can't, mm -hmm can't score and you can't go and get a replacement or getting a replacement striker who can score goals is never easier when the season's going mm. when you've not got money to offer somebody a lot of money to come and and they're playing for their own reasons they're playing for the money mm -hmm. <laughs> Difficult, and that's what's happened over over time here at Bakel. We, we we've got players and now thankfully this group what I've got majority of them are on contract mm -hmm. so, so at least you've got half a chance because you know that even if clubs come in, well, they're wasting the time because they're on contract. Mm, absolutely, so, yeah. Now, it's interesting you say, Brent, and it seems to me, Brent, that with Bake Up, obviously you've done a lot of hard work over the years and you've created a platform now that, you know, I think that from, from what I can see, I, I don't know much about where Southwood was when the class of 92 took over and how much work they had to do initially, but certainly Bake Up to me sounds like a long way down the line in the sense that it's, it's pretty much good to go with yourself, your understanding and, you know, any sort of money coming into the club obviously gets spent wisely and, and, and there is a pathway to get in, into, into possibly league football. Um, do, you, do you think the, the, the platforms there, Brent? If sort of anyone listening thinking, you know what, um, bake up, maybe I'll sort of get involved. You know, we look around the area and you think you've got, you know, like you mentioned, you know, Burnham in the Premier League, maybe Rochdale the other way in proximity, but there's certainly a massive catchment there. Um, if, if if someone did get involved going forward, do you feel the platforms, you know, good to go, Brent? To well, it's good. To, 
it's, it's, everything's good to go. Everything's good. But like I said, we need we need a, we need a class of ninety two. We need a we need people with big investment that mm. that, that, that want to back it and and come with us on the on the on the journey. That's that's what it wants. I mean, as it were, well documented. One of my young uh, prodigies from a few seasons back, Fabio Abreu. Mm. You know, gone on has gone on left back up uh, we we had him for a few years here and and coached him and i gave him an introduction into the first team and he's he's just gone out the last few uh, over the last few weeks he's been sold to a, a saudi arabia a club for something like 2.3 million mm. and you know it, we, we had him here and we could we could get feet you know we could get training fees but unfortunately the northwest counties league don't we, we can't get find the proof of this it, we can see all we've got all the cuttings we've got everything but we haven't got the proof of of um his registration because the northwest counties didn't uh, archive um items at that time mm -hmm. i mean we were you know putting money into the club by advertising and you know on the ground and stuff like that but basically i'm I'm kind of on my own and uh, at the end of the day you can only take the club so far and this is what I'm saying you mm. know for the club to go where it needs to go uh, and up there it needs you know it has to have finance it has to have the money because the more the more players that you've got on contract um, of quality you can ride the injuries mm. because you've got quality to come in you can ride suspensions because you've got quality to come in and uh, that will sustain you uh, and, and should get you to where you want to, uh, you know, want to be as long as your recruitment side of the club's correct. Mm. Uh, and that's that's probably what's happened. Well, probably it is. It's you know, if you look at the likes of, although they've drawn a, they've kind of drawn a line now, haven't they? And they've got to where they. Mm. FC United at Manchester they've kind of drawn a line where they've got but if you think about when they came in at first they steamrolled the, th the, the, the first division they steamrolled the Premier Division they steamrolled the next division and the next division but now they've like found a level mm. but they could go again if they wanted to invest more and more it's, it's, it's all down to your investment it's down to investments at the end of the day and you know one thing I've always said about Bake Up Borough Football Club while I've been here as a manager this is from a manager's point of view um, when I set out as a manager, an ambitious manager, I wanted to get, I always said, you know, you, you do your dream and you think that, you know, one day I'm going to be, you know, I, I'm going to manage, you know, Manchester United or whatever. I mean, it's a dream mm -hmm. and that's what you're aiming for, to, to be that manager, you know. People call me Fergie here, you know, because they think I'm a kind of the mini version of Alex Ferguson. Mm -hmm. That's you know, where's Fergie? People will come in here, where's Fergie? Is he, where is he? He's always like, yeah, yeah. But yeah. what I'm trying to get at is when you when you're a manager and you're coming out and you want to be a manager as a manager, you you know you want to be successful and that's what I were at. Ambitious wanted to be successful and we're successful at every club I've been at as a manager. Where because I'm a passionate football person, where I've kind of hit the buffers was was the day that because I'm a valley lad. And because Bakel were on the peripheral of, of going under and going out of business, I didn't want to be a Bakel. But I was asked to come and help out, which I helped out mm. uh, as a manager. I was after I'd helped out, I was walking away, but the club was going to fold. Mm. So I ended up putting a bit of an investment in, and I said, whatever happens. You know, there'll always be a Bakel Borough. You know, I'll make sure there's a Bakel Borough mm. now. Because I'm more and more involved in it, where I'm running the business side as well as the football side, I've always turned around. If I wanted to be uh, still ambitious as a manager, I can't afford to put the, 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 the future of this football club, which is like almost around about 140 year old, mm. into jeopardy through my own egotistic ways of wanting to be successful. Because mm -hmm. it'd be easy for me to be successful. Because all I do is just go and offer you, if you're if you're a player, 
a king's ransom to come and play for Absolutely, me. Absolutely, yeah, you know? yeah. Not quality, and I'll go and get another one and another one, but that'll only last for so long, and then you'll go bankrupt. Absolutely, and, yeah. But what I'm basically saying, but I'll get the success, and and and, and, I, and I'll I'll have bankrupt of the club, and I'll walk out of here, and I'll end up in another job somewhere else, but the club's mm-hmm. gone. Now, what I've turned around and said is, I hold that that was a, you know, I am not going to put the the, you know, an hundred and forty year old football club future uh, and history into jeopardy over my ambitions. Absolutely, that, yeah, that's that's, that's a, you know, a really powerful point that uh, Brent for sure. And I suppose one thing that you've always done is given you know the youth. An opportunity, and, and and obviously everyone loves to see uh, homegrown players coming through and, and breaking into the first team. And I mean, to be honest, Brent, you know, I don't, I don't know what goes on at certain clubs, but I've been at, personally. I think that I, I find it quite strange. Certain clubs have kind of done away with, um, you know, um, certain tiers of football like the 23s. But you know, each to their own, and they've got their own decisions for doing that. You've got the 21s too, and. What's the sort of what's the twenty the, the young players coming through, Brent? Is there like a I know you place a massive priority on young players and for any invest, I think that's a great thing because you mentioned the the opportunity to go on and and perhaps play professionally like some some players have done at Bake Up. Will the youth team still be a big priority at Bake Up, Brent, going forward? Well, it has to be. But but let me tell you, and I'm I'm not going to turn around and say too much of that about this on the air because somebody will take my idea. But so I'm not going to I'm not going to leak it. But mm. I'm telling you now, all the football league clubs are having serious problems, and uh, and and they're talking about their academies and having a rethink, and then the the situations at football league level where you know clubs like Manchester United and Burnley, and you know these clubs are carrying you know. Good youth, you know, good good fringe play, you know, like where they like kind of the elite development team. Mm. You follow me? But there's nowhere for them to play. Mm-hmm. You know as well as I know what happens is at the end of the season when they, when they've got to make decisions, it all comes down to finance when people get get released. Or so take Burnley for instance. You know, if they've if they've if they've only got the finances to keep like six players on. But they would really want to keep mm. all eleven on. You get me? Mm-hmm. But they can't afford to. So there's five players that's going to get released. Now, mm. what I'm saying is, I have a situation in my head that it, a, a club like Burnley gets involved with a club like Bake Up, and they don't release those players. This the, the kind of well, they do release them, but they don't. What I'm saying is, is they go and play for a team like Bake Up, sign a contract, but they have first refusal on them. Mm. And uh, they keep tabs on them. They, they haven't really, really released them. They have in the haven't, if you follow me logic, what I'm trying to say. Absolutely, yeah, that's for sure. They're on a, they continue their education. They're on two-year uh, a contract at Bake Up. And uh, if they see that what they believed in, that this kid, this kid is, is, is going to be, you know, that's what he needed, men's football. Mm. He's done really well at Bake Up. Then they come and take him back. But to do that, again, it comes down to finances, mm. right? And I need somebody that's going to back that concept because to put several players on, especially somebody that's come from a football league uh club that's been in an elite development squad there, you know, that's been on the peripheral of the first team, they're not going to be cheap. Mm. Uh, but there's too many of them going on by the wayside. They're getting released and then they're, what they're doing, they're going, they're going in oblivion. And, mm. that's, and that's wrong. And I, think yeah. that, I think that some somewhere along the line, some of these football league clubs could do no worse than jumping in bed indirectly with a good non-league club mm. and, and, and continuing so they, they kind of keep the players that they want to keep under contract they st- but the others go to the, where you go it's a bit like when Manchester United were in it's just the same model really what I'm saying mm. it's a bit like when Manchester United had that arrangement where it, where, where it FC Bruce that's it, right yeah, I think it was Antwerp I can't remember now. I think it was, yeah, it was Antwerp I can't remember now Brent, but I don't know what the one you mean yeah Work. Yeah, Antwerp. Well, yeah. So they went there. I think Warren Joyce went out there, didn't That's they? That's right, I so believe they, so. Yeah, they, yeah. But they're the link to Man United. Mm. 
No, absolutely, and that's a great point you make there. And, and particularly when you got these days, like young players, they don't sort of mature, you know, physically and mentally even until a certain age. And a lot of talent goes by the wayside. And it's a massive difference, you know, playing in, in first team football compared to the uh, to the reserve teams. That's a bit of the competitiveness too, Brent. You're competing obviously week to week. Um, you know, it makes a huge difference playing in, in first team football. You're competing, and, and, and that's for sure. But it's been really interesting, Brent. I'm sort of um, mindful of time, and we're drawing to the close of the show. It's, it's been a fascinating insight for our listeners, that's for sure. No doubt they'll, you know, um, have sort of taken uh, a lot on board, really. So I really want to thank you, Brent, for coming on board the show. No, it's my pleasure. Yeah, great to have you on board. And um, that was uh, Brent Peters, who's the manager of Baker Borough Football Club. Give us, giving us a really interesting and informative insight into the world of non-league. It's been on the show before, and at this moment in time, obviously, it's different circumstances, circumstances we could never have imagined a year or so ago. But, you know, I think it's you know really important that you know, non-league football continues to be backed and, and, you know, we've got people like Brent in the game at non-league. We can be confident that, you know, that the, the game will keep moving forward. Um, so, you know, certainly I would encourage anyone as and when, and at this point where pre-record uh, restrictions are changing, get back to seeing football, get yourself down to uh, a non-league gl- uh, club and, you know, get yourself down to the likes of, of Bake Up, um, especially on a week that Salford's not playing. If you're a Salford listener, um, there's a tradition with Bake Up and, and, and obviously Salford as well uh, and players too. So get yourself down and, 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 and check the team out and, uh, and see what it's all about. So it's Brent Peters live, well, on the Friday Sports Show, 94.5 FM, Salva City Radio, your host, Jimmy Petruzzi.